So I, I should say that normally we do this over Indian food or, or, or musical instruments. Um, but there's nobody I'd rather be having this conversation with because there's sort of four stages of Jaron Lanier. The first one, you think he's a crazy person. Then you're told that he's a visionary. Then you realize, no, 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 he's probably just faking it. And then when you get to the final stage, you realize, no, he's pretty much usually always spot on and never cowed by his employer or by, way, by the group think of Silicon Valley. And uh, almost always, I find that we eventually get to his point of view. So there's, <laughs> there's a, an opportunity here, because what, the way I see it, um, we're supposed to be discussing an analog world riding on corporate digital infrastructure and asking the question, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, the Valley, as Jaron has pointed out, has transitioned from being a place of rebels in garages to being the backbone of our world. We have a world that cannot be disentangled between the electron and bit layer and the physical and atomic layer. And they are in eternal dialogue now for this foreseeable and perhaps the eternal future. So it seems to me that we are going to have to take very seriously this question of these very large structures. And we are, in my opinion, shying away from trying to invent new things. If new economic thinking is to mean anything, and I think uh, you know, what I've learned from Rob and from Pia is that Pia's new center, the Center for Innovation, Growth, and Society, is looking at what is the new economic thinking that, need, that is necessary for the new economic structures. So to that end, let's just come up with a placeholder word so that we don't start talking about things like monopolies, because I don't think we're ready to talk about them, and I don't think it biases the conversation. Let's talk about hydropolis, from the Greek <laughs> word for deep, right, or heavy, and cellars. And the idea is that we don't really know what these are, so at least it will crowd out our, our attempt to go back. <laughs> Jaron, do you feel that the, we're really someplace that requires new language and new thinking, or do you think that we just need to adapt the old thinking properly and move the abstraction a little bit uh, around the edges with a few tweaks? Oh, that's a, it's a, I have resisted trying to come up with too many new terms uh, because... Uh, Every time I've had, I've come up with a few terms for things that have been widely adopted, but the meaning always goes haywire when it becomes popular. I came up with virtual reality and it means something different now. And uh, I, uh, so uh, I've noticed that the terms that catch on often capture exactly the wrong sense that I think is important. So right now, for instance, a lot of people are calling the thing I've criticized surveillance capitalism after a, a, an author who's come up with that. And I don't think that's right, because I, I, I don't, um, I think what it does is it, con it confuses surveillance with manipulation and it confuses capitalism with evil or something, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not, it's, it, it's the wrong phrase, but that, that seems to be the one that's catching on, so it's possible that all of us are going to have to start using it, because at a certain point, you can't reject the way the language evolves if you want to communicate even with there, it. So. Just, that's one facet yeah, of the but it's tricky. I mean, I tried to come up with a cheeky, a few cheeky names for things in my last book, and I think I, I overdid it in that case, and, and I don't know if, how widely they're. Um, but I, I, it's, it's, language is very hard with this. Um, it's, it's difficult because um, sometimes the concepts we're dealing with are actually quite old, although we're approaching them in a new way, from a new angle, and so if we use the old language, it can sometimes um, blind us to the way we need to think about them. Uh, for instance, um, well, you meant um, monopsonies uh, is an example of something that used to mean one thing, and now it's being used in a somewhat different way, but it's, it's related. So yeah, the, lang the language is really tricky. Uh, so with these digital platforms, mm -hmm. it strikes me that what, what they have that's very, if you think about object-oriented programming, you have the paradigm of is a versus has a. And you, you would prefer in general not to say that a Lamborghini is a radio because it can receive signals and it can turn them into something understandable and auditory. You'd prefer to say that it has a radio. It strikes me that some of these digital platforms have many different concerns under one roof and that we keep making the mistake of um, looking at one of the objects and one of the subcomponents and assuming that that characterizes... Yeah, so, right. So this, this is really tricky. So um, there's a very widespread feeling in the world that something's gone terribly awry. And I share that feeling. I, I've just 
been traveling the world visiting a lot of different places. And it's really striking to me that there's a similar political feeling that's rather dark and disruptive and bizarre um, in places as dissimilar as Sweden and Brazil, although it's, it's obviously more profound and definitive in Brazil than in Sweden. Um, but what you have is the rise of a kind of a, a cranky, paranoid um, feeling in the society, which was always there. It's not anything new, but I think it's been um, I, cultured. It's been it's been amplified a little bit by the technology. It's it's a little bit like compound interest. You do a small change over a cumulative period of time can be important. I think that's what we've done, and I, I can go into the theory of why that is. But we've in particular. Um, amplified crankiness and paranoia in societies and that's having an effect on um, politics but also on many other things on relationships and families and all sorts of things and the question of how to cut into this so my buddy Tim Wu thinks we need to have a new a new wave of antitrust enforcement and wants to break up some of the big tech companies um, there are other people who are uh, privacy oriented like the GDPR uh, there are um, just people who hate capitalism and want to nationalize these things. I don't like any of those. I, I really think th those are all the wrong approach, um, even though I like many of the people involved. I have tremendous respect for Tim. I just don't happen to agree with him on this particular point. Um, I think that what you should do, if things are going awry, is you should look at the incentives because incentives tend to be very powerful in influencing outcomes. That's why they're incentives. And if there's a way to modify the incentives, you can often get better outcomes. And in this case, it seems to me plainly clear that we've made a big mistake. And the big mistake is we've created an internet where anytime two people connect or anytime somebody connects to services or anything, it's financed not by that person, but by a third party who wants to influence that person. And it's what we call the advertising model it started out cute, it started out innocent. I was there, I was selling Google a company just when they adopted it, when it was very, very, when Google was small. And it was, um, the problem is that the algorithms got better, the users, the, uh, the actors, both good and bad, got more and more sophisticated. The computers, of course, got faster. And what started out as advertising has, guided by this incentive structure, turned into a very creepy, constant uh, feedback cycle designed to addict and manipulate people. Um, it only changes people gradually, but as I say, cumulative small changes do have an effect after a while. It's stupid. It's a stupid business model. It's unneeded. I don't dislike, t I happen to love tech companies. I really, the last thing I want to do is hurt a Google. Um, I, I, they're my friends. Uh, I do think that the business model needs to change in order for them to thrive, and I think they would do well. I think they would do better. Um, let, let, let me give you a counter argument that's quite disturbing to me. Okay. What if the idea is that the tech companies and the tech platforms, maybe through very few faults of their own, maybe through, through faults of their own, I, I don't want to prejudice it, are actually insufficiently creepy? And what I mean by that is that we are on one side of a half-silvered mirror with no real concept of what's going on on the other side of that partition. In other words, they are observing us at a level, and we are roughly oblivious most of the time with the level of observation, the amount of data, how the data is being used, because we haven't really been exposed via this half-silvered mirror to what's going on mm. on the other side. Maybe the idea is that we're freaked out because it's not creepy enough. Uh, well, I've been pretty well exposed to the other side, to what goes on on the inside of the server and on the inside of the tech company. And I know a few other people in this room, at least, have also been exposed to it. And the truth is, um, I wish I could tell some of the stories of things I've seen, but I'm kind of sworn not to. But um, uh, one of the things is that um, the algorithms aren't really that good. We don't know quite why they work. Um, the whole scheme just barely works. It works at the edge of the edge of efficacy. It's not. There's nothing. There's not some incredible magic alchemy going on that's running the world. I think it's. I, I think it's. Uh, it is barely competent and barely effective. If we're 
if, if we were going to try to get to any ground truth, if that was even possible. Um, I've seen the, the tech companies tend that run on this model, which is basically of the big ones, Google and Facebook, and of the small ones, Twitter and Snap, et cetera, um, they tend to talk about themselves in two ways. They're schizophrenic. When they're facing public criticism or uh, possible regulation, they'll say, oh, no, the data isn't valuable. We can't really do that much to people. We're barely effective at all, which is somewhat true, perhaps. But then if you get into a situation where they're selling the people who are the true customers, the advertisers, then it's like all brags, and it becomes almost, they do cast themselves almost in a surreal light as these like super powerful wizards. I mean, it's a, it's a very strange transformation to behold. Um, but, I, you know, the thing is, the ground truth isn't so much what matters. What matters is the incentives. So in other words, um, if you have an incentive structure that gets people to do a certain thing, then that's what will happen, whether or not the ideology around that incentive structure makes any sense or not. Well, it's a totally separate question. All right. But Let's imagine that you have two businesses, for example. You have something like a social uh, media sub subunit, and you have an advertising unit. And you decide that you want to disconnect them, and you want to have people pay for the service that they were originally uh, drawn to directly. Um, is that something that's actually viable, or do you believe, I mean, in other words, if you actually tried to reteach the world? Yeah, you know, I think we have some excellent examples in real life of this having been done. So we, we, have, we can be empirical, we don't have to be hypothetical. Um, a very obvious example that's in our faces is Netflix. And so you can say a portion of the population on Netflix that's paying for it is actually feeling like they're paying less because they moved from paying cable bills to Netflix. So for them, it was a reduction. However, Netflix has a vast younger um, viewership. And those younger people had to move from streaming. They were doing torrents for free, and it was a pain in the butt. And the Netflix service is actually better for them. And suddenly, they're paying for it. And you have um, Netflix isn't a perfect business. It's not perfectly out of the woods yet. It has a, there are a lot of questions about what will happen to it, but there's no question that at the very least it's shown that people can start to pay for something that they expected to be free for a while and be happy about it. Indeed, um, it's created a cultural moment that's called peak TV, and one of the things I like to think about is what would peak search or peak social media look like when they go through similar transformations. The difference between the era of free video and paid video is Game of Thrones and like a lot of stuff that people really like. When, people, when you pay for stuff, sometimes the stuff gets better. I mean, hypothetically, if markets mean anything, that should once in a while be true, right? It's not always true, it's not guaranteed, but you know, sometimes it can be true. If you pay for stuff, it can get better. So uh, that ancient idea happened. Uh, with Netflix. There are many other examples that I like quite a lot that I won't go into here because you might not be familiar with them in the gaming world, where people are paying for various kinds of experiences, such as watching others who are very good playing a game that you play. And it's actually when those same things are available for free with a little less convenience, and people are paying. It's actually the, the market growth is really cool. So I, I, I don't believe it's viable to argue that nobody would pay. I just feel like that, that should be put to rest at this point by empirical results. The more interesting question to me is if we went in the other direction. If we said, what if we start paying people for the value of their data as an alternative to universal basic income so that whenever the robots hypothetically will show up and put this or that person out of work, the person will have a new kind of job creating excellent data for that very robot and have a Your really- Your concept of mids? Well, the mids is something else. I, we can get to that in a second. Um, uh, but I, just, just let me, if I could just, um, I've been involved in a number of um, designs in which we did put people out of work. Um, the one that really haunts me is language translation. People who translate between languages for a living have seen a tenfold decrease in their job prospects that, that parallels what's happened to recording musicians and investigative journalists, and yet the data from those people is still needed in order to keep the automatic translator systems up to date with current events and pop culture and everything. So we're telling them, you're buggy whips, you're obsolete, 
too bad, but on the other hand, we need your data, we need your data in order to make you obsolete. And there's something just fundamentally undignified and icky and dishonest and stupid about that. And, and so if we could just pay those people, we could also tell them what data we need and we could make our, our translation services better instead of just having to anonymously steal it and not even be able to incentivize them to make the data better. So on just so many levels, I think there's this opportunity for a more dignified next stage economy instead of people facing a, a sense of obsolescence, whether that'll actually come about, which is a different question, of course. Um, do you want me to talk about MIDS? Well, just to set that up a little bit, I mean, I had been thinking for a while about user unions uh, because mm -hmm. of the problem of the, uh, the EULAs and the, effectively you have a contract of adhesion which is shoved at you by uh, a multi-billion dollar concern with uh, floors and floors worth of lawyers and you're told to sign it or not. Um, who is negotiating for you? Can you not uh, band together with a group of people and negotiate something? I think you're bringing up two very interesting different topics. One of which is, is data a new input to the production function? So you have KL and then D, so the KLD model. And then you also have the question of, do you have um, some ability to bind together with others in order to take care of your collective interests mm -hmm. relative to the large uh, platform which is trying to give you things for free and is implicitly involving you in a barter economy where you're giving away things like data uh, in exchange for the service and you have no idea how much the data is worth because you don't know what it would command at market well, and you don't know how does. it can be used against? Nobody, it's never tested. We don't, we don't know how to value it uh, in, in most cases. In some cases we have some clues now. But yeah, um, well, okay, so there's a few, MIDS, if you want to read a piece on MIDS, um, uh, my, re my uh, colleague Glenn Weil and I have a piece in Harvard Business Review from a month or two ago that describes this and I think it's distributed to all of you, right? It's in the packet or something. So the idea of a MIDS is in part a sort of a, a little bit like a union, you could say, where people who are offering um, data um, can band together to collectively bargain for the value of their data instead of being uh, put into a Hobbesian competition of each against each. But the thing is, I, I want to be very careful here, and this is where we get back to this use of old words. You can say, well, that sounds like a labor union. That sounds like a leftist thing. But I want to point out that in the physical world, we were able to make this distinction between human labor and other kinds of value, which might be called capital. And, but we had exactly the same mechanism on the other side. We might call it a corporation, or perhaps um, a law firm might have a partnership. We, we always have situations where people band together to, to not be each competing against the other, absolutely, till they, till they grind themselves down. And so the difference between a corporation and a union in the world of digital data, I think, becomes harder to, to, it's not as fundamental. That's why I said barter because it's, yeah. it's two parties on both sides entering into an exchange. And mm -hmm. at the moment, um, you know, it sort of has the, this sort of predator victim feel. But if we actually right. recognized it as barter, we made it less of a half silvered mirror and we dignified it by creating some kind of an organization, it would be neither left nor right. It would right, before, be <laughs> before we came up with MIDS, we were trying to call them UNORPS or Corpians, you know, because now it's I both like- your naming problem. Yeah, like a, like a union and a corporation at the same time, but MIDS just seems like better. So it's neither the left nor of the right. It's neither from socialism or capitalism. It's just a, an obvious information theoretic necessity that you can't have each person competing against each other person and have a market that grows. If each person is competing against each other person, the market will collapse. And, and that's, you need corporations. You can't just have sole proprietorships. You, and, and this is also, this is actually an area where I maybe don't totally agree with Tim Wu about antitrust trust on these things. Like, I think if you're going to have big clouds, you need big cloud companies. I don't mind the fact that Google's big in and of itself. I don't view that as an intrinsic problem. And some people, some people do. And uh, I, I think, but getting back to the mids, there's another way to think about mids, which actually comes from a bit more of a social and political angle. Um, 
I think uh, two writers I'll reference are Hannah Arendt and de Tocqueville, uh, classics, and both of them talked about the role of organizations and civil societies that were sometimes unsung, not exactly official, neither part, neither business nor government, and yet absolutely essential to any sense of a decent or stable society. And so what we're proposing in the Harvard Business Review article is that these mids, these things that are sort of like corporations or unions, for people dealing in a data economy could also become these civil society um, organizations that Arendt and de Tocqueville talk about. And that's really the point of the piece, that we might be able to see a kind of a, of a synthesis here of uh, two different ideas, um, both of which are ancient, neither of which is new, but both of which could really be applicable here. Well, let me try another angle with this uh, to try to tease out some of these weird mm -hmm. symmetries between public and private. So one argument I'd like to make is, is that we need some of these platforms to become private. And they are assumed to be private, but they're not. And here, let me give you the reasoning behind this. In general, if I define that which is private to be that which is non-public, it re references a public space. But I have no ability to get to the internet without using an ISP. And I generally land in somebody's server. And my question is, where is the analog of the on-ramp, uh, the public roads and the public parks, so that I can freely conduct myself in terms of my speech mm. uh, without touching anything private, so that I can actually give these corporations and firms or hydropolis the freedom <laughs> to actually be private entities? I like hydropolis. I, uh, I've been using duopsony. But I like Hydropoly better. Come to the dark side. <laughs> so what, what about this idea that, that we need to make these firms actually private by, and, and let me come up with a crazier idea. Uh -huh. um, why is there no American internet? And, and I, I mean this in a very specific way. What I, I did not realize until a, a friend uh, on Twitter received a notification that Twitter was passing through that she had viol violated Pakistan's blasphemy laws, according to Pakistan, even though she was not a Pakistani citizen and she was sitting in Canada. And then I started realizing that we'd inherited hate speech laws from Germany being on the wrong side of history during World War II, and we have libel concerns from the UK. Have we not come up with a garbage world culture by touching each of these separate national cultures with its patchwork of laws that cannot be mm. unified. And there is, in fact, no place in this new world that we've created that actually functions according to our own intuitions from where we happen to live and, and hold a passport. So yeah, this is something, this is actually another side of the MIDS idea from my perspective. So there's this thing going on where, as you point out, people um, petition either their national governments or the companies themselves and say, what this person is doing is horrible speech, this shouldn't be allowed. And um, the well-meaning activists, typically coming from the left, but not exclusively, have um, incrementally um, gotten more and more speech regulation to happen, particularly within Google and Facebook. It's also, it's also happened at Microsoft. Uh, and. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that it's sort of like you're petitioning some corporation, oh, please, corporation, regulate my speech. I mean, if you, if you evolve this further, it doesn't go to a very nice place at all. It, it be, so, but can I just say, but this is the point of the, the, the civil society organizations. Like, what there should be, in my view, is mids, each of which have a certain character and a certain standard. So there might be one mid that is about scientific data that, that scientists use, and it's all about scientific integrity and uh, peer review and honesty and ethics. And there might be another one that's about aesthetics, and there might be another one that's just wacky. And they, also, they become essentially like brands, but the thing is you can start to rely on them in the way you can rely on a certain news source to maybe have a certain feeling about it that you might even find biased, but you kind of know it, it's honest, and you know it's there. Instead of the, the internet itself having that, like, to the stronger the institutions are that are able to have kind of a branded flavor to them, the less that burden is put on the, the raw thing itself, because then people have a place they can go. But right now, to get to, let's I don't know, the New York Times or whatever, most people go through Facebook. So as long as you have this private entity that does become the universal access point for most people, 
Unfortunately, people are forced to petition it to regulate their own speech. It's a bizarre, bizarre situation. And so the, the, a strong civil society actually allows you to have a less intrusive government. That's, that, that's a, key, um, a key idea. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's also another angle on this that's maybe worth talking about is the history. Because what had happened, in my view, the internet got screwed up by two waves of ideology colliding, both of which thought too much of themselves. One was the, um, this faith in kind of a purist libertarianism that was really floating through the valley when the internet was just getting born. And I was hanging out with Al Gore, who, who did kind of create the, the internet by bribing incompatible networks to talk to each other, roughly speaking. And I remember saying to him once, we're giving this gift of hundreds of billions of dollars to persons unknown to add eventually uh, absolutely needed functions that we could just build in. The internet was born without any prominence. There's no context, there's no history. You don't know what, who, what points at what. There's no personal account. There's no representation of people of any kind. There's no inherent storage or method for storage. All of that stuff could have been in there, but by leaving those things out, we were creating this room for the brilliance of private industry, except, except that we knew that network effects would create natural monopolies out of these things. We knew we were gonna, we were just kind of, creating this niche to be filled by the Facebook and the Google of the future. Google came along and created context and Facebook created accounts, roughly speaking, and those were things that were just needed. That it wouldn't function without them. Sure. And I'm not convinced in some sense that had the wisest designers prevailed, that we haven't actually created something so new that um, these problems would have been sol solvable in the, under the best circumstances. That's because fair enough. I, I, that's, a, that's a fair comment. Well, yeah. We're violating a principle of locality in a way that nothing ever has before. So that the, you know, when I, when I tweet something at four in the morning and, and then I get responses from Singapore and Chile, uh, you know, suddenly I realize that I'm not talking to, the, to whoever it was I thought I was talking to. And in some sense, as long as this ability to affect things at, at scale for a single individual, um, without any kind of locality, I don't know of a self-correcting system that works under those circumstances without running into questions of epistemic inconsistency, do you? Uh, yeah, that seems fair. I mean, it's true. I mean, this gets, this would maybe be too geeky for this, con this conversation, but yeah, I think it's true. If, if you have some kind of a poly principle and some kind of a conservation principle with just those two things, almost any model gains a kind of um, wholeness and integrity that's remarkable in which, in which you can have emergent phenomena. And if you leave either of them out, you tend to have models in which nothing interesting happens. I, I, I don't know if that's a law, um, but it, it certainly appears to be, I, I mean, I think that's kind of beyond the edge of what we totally understand. But I, I've seen that consistently in hundreds of cases. And it, another question I wanted to ask before mm -hmm. opening things up is that we tend to talk about very large platforms and their, their uh, supposedly infinite power. But one thing that my group has been very interested in looking at is the small platform of Patreon, uh, which came out with a very clear standard. Now, again, this is, to your point, people want to pay for things so badly that they're willing to pay for things oh, that are yeah, being delivered that's a great for, example. for free. Yeah, nobody's right? making anybody put a penny into Patreon. Okay, so yeah. that, now the CEO was good enough to come out and say, there's only one way to get thrown off of our platform, and it's called Manifest Observable Behavior, or Mob Rule, M-O-B, which is kind of <laughs> funny. And uh, no sooner had this been articulated very clearly that Patreon started throwing people off the platform who people wanted to support for things that were not manifestly observable on-platform behavior. Uh, in fact, it didn't even appear to violate the terms of service uh, as it was understood. Is it possible that there's no consistent way of implementing terms of services and that what we're going to have are arbitrary decisions? Right. Uh, okay, so once again, let me cover the concept of mids from yet another angle. Okay, so um, one of the things about Patreon that I don't like is um, it has what I call a siren server effect from, from the book Who Owns the Future. So. Um, Typically, if you have a population of people interacting with each other or just existing, and you measure some quality across them, you'll, you'll get a bell curve distribution with 
uh, for all kinds of height or whatever. But when they're organized from a central hub on, a, on single terms, when there's like one meeting place, then they'll be organized into a zip di distribution when they have a small number of super winners and then a long tail that becomes very thin. And so you have this, uh, whenever you see a zip distribution and it's an internet thing, then you, have a, you probably have a siren server. Now, the, the way to get back, and I think you, need, you want bell curves in society, because I think that that creates uh, stability and maximizes the number of people with good lives and maximizes the chances that people who have a potential to contribute will be able to, and et cetera, et cetera, and maximizes social mobility and incentive and all, many, many things. So I don't think you need a perfect bell curve. I don't believe that you should clamp down some kind of a standard on a society, but if it's not kind of looking like a bell curve, you got a problem. And the language for that in the U.S. is a strong middle class. That's that language is a little. It means different things in other parts of the world. But um, so how do you how do you get a system that does that? Well, I think the way you get it is instead of having each person compete against each person in a global system, which is essentially what happens on Patreon and YouTube and on many other systems where you have just a tiny number of super winners and everything falls down. You have people banned into mids, but multiple mids for each person, so it's heterogeneous. So each person is a member of many different mids, and different mids have different fates and so forth. And what then you have happen is you have each person find paths to value through many different what you, mids or unions or corporations simultaneously until they discover the paths that are the best for them. And then what I've, I've done this both empirically in different populations, trying to study things that happen when we have an inadvertent setup like this that we can study, and also with agent-based models. Are we running out of time? Mm -hmm. we, when you do that, you get a bell curve. So, so mids give you a bell curve instead of a zip dif distribution, and I think Patreon doesn't have mids, so it has a zip distribution, uh, which is the race of each person against each in, in a single criteria through a single server point. And uh, could we all join in uh, thanking Jaron Lear? <laughs>